On the question of whether women's issues are defined in ways that are inclusive of communities of color, I would answer in this way. It depends on who's doing the defining, um, who's doing the defining, uh, including which institutions are in charge of defining women's rights. And I will say that if the courts are in charge, in particular the Supreme Court, um, then we probably are in some trouble. <laughs> now, I'll, during the course of my talk, I will point to some examples of why I think that's the case with respect to uh, court-based rights. But first, I will start off by saying that I know that there is some distance between um, where many of us want to be in terms of building cross-boundary, including cross-racial uh, coalitions among women through my own teaching. Um, one of the things that I do in my teaching is uh, to introduce my students and my courses um, on, uh, on law and social reform, which includes units on the civil rights and the women's rights and labor movements, um, to the seminal uh, work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a legal scholar, um, who has written about issues of intersectionality. And I taught this article just the other week um, where uh, Professor Crenshaw uh, calls on the courts and on feminist communities to think about the ways in which um, legal issues need to be defined such that they s address the problems of women of color um, as paradigmatic of um, oppressions that can affect women. And I had some of the students in my class respond um, by saying that the article really resonated with them. Um, and some of the students went on to say that when they have um, organizational meetings of feminist groups, they find that the meetings are overwhelmingly attended by white students. And the, the, the students, my students were expressing um, you know, sadness and frustration over this and saying that, you know, the, the students of, of color tend to define themselves first um, as students of color and we want them to see that they have a stake in the women's movement. Um, and I have to say that's not quite the lesson that they were supposed to learn from that <laughs> article, right? And my response, a very sympathetic response, um, was, you know, I, I recalled the words of uh, Constance Baker Motley, um, the judge uh, and civil rights lawyer from the 1960s, whose biography I'm writing, um, who once said that she did not embrace the women's movement because it did not embrace her. And, you know, I said to my, my student that to the extent that you have that sense, it's probably because there's a communication or rhetorical problem. So how are the issues being defined was my response. And we went on to have a very productive conversation about how one can define women's issues so that they are actually inclusive of a wide range of women. And that is what I think we have to do. It is the logical thing to do. Now, in terms of the courts and the Supreme Court, Supreme Court doctrine, let me give some examples of what is problematic. Well, I mentioned the Crenshaw piece. Professor Crenshaw talked about Title VII law um, and the idea of women being able to bring intersectional claims. So claims that are predicated on uh, sex inequality as well as racial inequality, um, so that there, there are multiple claims, complex claims. Now, in fact, the federal courts have recognized those claims. But one can bring a claim, but can you actually win them? And what we find is that 90, some 90% 90 of those kinds of claims fail. Um, 
um, as compared to about 70% of claims that are singular claims, which isn't a great uh, success rate either. Um, but uh, the more complex claims are really, really difficult to make. What other kinds of rights uh, adjudications are, are difficult from the perspective of being inclusive? Well, what about abortion rights? Um, I will simply pose this question. What does it mean for women um, and for women's equality that at the same time that the court, as uh, Professor Mayurius indicated, it seems to be on the cusp of expanding equality, privacy rights, um, for on the basis of sexuality and perhaps recognizing um, a right to marriage for um, gays is steadily restricting reproductive rights for women. What does it mean that those things are happening at the same time? And in particular, what does it mean that the court seems very, very unable to appreciate that impoverished women are really, the court has, has pretty much eliminated um, abortion rights for impoverished women. Um, deeply, deeply disappointing. Even Justice O'Connor um, in Casey, the case that uh, preserved Roe, um, was not at all sympathetic to um, the argument that for a woman who is impoverished, having to wait for 24 hours, um, having to go back and forth to one's home, um, could in fact be an undue burden simply because of the lack of resources. There are many ways in which the court's uh, jurisprudence is limiting. And so the question then becomes, well, how can rights be defined in a way that are inclusive? So here are some thoughts. One thing to do is to recognize that well, yes, if we think about women's rights in terms of what the court has said, in terms of classifications, then they're problematic. But if we think outside of those categories, uh, say in terms of education and health care, and recognize that women's opportunities are implicated in those areas, then we can reach women. For instance, Consider that the Department of Education just um, uh, issued a report finding that in the area of school discipline, 12% of black girls have been suspended over the course of a year as compared to 2% of white girls, 6% of white boys, and 20% of black boys. So there's a gender phenomenon there. There is a girls' and women's issues right there. And yet, I will remind you that the Obama administration actually um, has recently rolled out a policy, uh, my brother's keeper policy, that is exclusively focused on um, black boys, um, which, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> What about health care? Now, there was a lot of discussion and praise of the court for saving the Affordable Care Act, um, likely premature praise, uh, I will say. Um, one of the things that wasn't discussed in terms of Sibelius uh, very much was the Medicaid expansion, the effect of that case on the Medicaid expansion essentially um, permitting states to decide to expand or, or not. So really restructuring, um, uh, the in creating a different incentive structure than uh, the Obama administration had imagined. What the result has been is that a large swath of states, about 22 states, including in places like Texas and West Virginia and Virginia, so South Carolina, sort of the usual suspects, um, haven't in fact expanded um, Medicaid, which impacts women, which means that many, many women will suffer and even die from preventable illnesses. This is a woman's issue. And if it's dis described as a woman's issue, then women's issues will be inclusive. 
What about access to higher education, affirmative action? One of the wonderful things that Justice Ginsburg has done in the course of her career is to describe herself as a beneficiary of affirmative action in employment. Um, affirmative action, the curtailing of affirmative action by the courts can be understood as a women's issue. Well, because some of the beneficiaries of affirmative action um, are women, including but not limited to women of color. And there was someone in the audience who asked a very good question, um, actually, about um, the parity issue and how um, that means the impact is actually um, negative for women when institutions of higher education decide that there needs to be parity because it's absolutely right that women tend to perform better in terms of the indicators that universities are looking for. I could go on and on and on. The point that I won't. Um, the, point, <laughs> <laughs> the point that I want to make is that um, women's issues and the, the possibility of collaboration and inclusiveness presents itself. Um, if we define the issues in ways that meet people where they are. Um, we can be inclusive if we work at it. Thank you. Thank you, Tamiko. That's great.